Good morning, everyone. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to our worship service on this, the Lord's Day. Our call to worship is from Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20, and it reads as follows. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of over all creation. For, he, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through, the, through his blood shed on the cross. That, that is the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, we approach you with hearts full of gratitude and awe for the revelation of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as described in these passages we have just read. Father, we acknowledge that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, and in him all things hold together. And Lord, we thank you for the supremacy of Christ in our lives and in the, in the entire universe. Lord, we recognize his role as the head of the church, the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Oh, Father, how grateful we are for the reconciling work that he accomplished for us on the cross. Oh, Father, how grateful we are that through the shedding of his blood, we have the opportunity to be reconciled to you, our holy and perfect God. Father, we pray that we will continually grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, deepening our relationship with you. Oh, Father, please help us to live lives that are worthy of the Lord and to bear fruit in every good work as we are strengthened by the power of Christ. So, Father, we lift up our praises to you, for you are above all powers, you are above all kings. Oh, Father, we praise you for your majesty and for the glory of Christ our Lord, for he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. O oh, Lord, may our lives be a true reflection of his love and of his grace. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be back with all of you lovely people in Randburg. Um, I actually uh, realized last week it's quite, it's quite a trip from the, the back there, so I got a head start this, this morning. Um, I'm not as fit as I look. Um, but uh, just reflecting and listening to um, like the organ playing some some Christmas carols before the service, I was thinking, you know, the of the the, the one that goes joy to the world, and there's the one line that's um, far as the curse is is found. What a, what an amazing um, line that kind of you know as far as as the curse is found and the hope that Christ brings us and you know that that brought to mind a, a proper missionary story because what I want to do if you remember from last week is kind of have a, a missional focus uh, leading up to Christmas so what um, what God um, has in store for us through the Missio Day and how that's shown and demonstrated to us uh, through Christ and then how we apply that through the, the work of the Holy Spirit. So what's, what's a, a good missionary uh, sermon series without a, a good missionary story? So as I was, I was growing up, I heard all these, um, this, this one missionary, he had all these snake stories. And this is, this is what, what brought it up because of the, that line of joy to the world far as the curse is found because there's the serpent found in the story. So, and if you remember, God, you know, handed out punishments um, that he didn't hand them out. He, there was consequences for Adam and Eve's sin and rebellion and, you know, 
you kind of see those, those playing out today. So, um, you know, women will uh, have great pain in, in childbirth and men, uh, we will have to work hard at the ground. And, you know, I think I'm like, yeah, we won because, yeah, I've got thick boots and a spade at my hand. I'm, I'm fine, you know. So many years ago, um, about eight years ago, I, I did a missions trip to, to Botswana. And, um, you know, if you're not scared of snakes and if you're not scared of black mambas, um, please talk to me because I need, I need advice. Because the, the one day the, the neighbor had this, this black mamba in their, in their garden. And so we got there, and if you've ever been to Botswana, a garden is, is like a desert um, with like corrugated iron. And I was like, man, I don't think we're going to find this snake. We'll find everything else that's, that's here, but how are we going to find this snake? But they knew exactly where this, this snake was. So we went, and it was, it was hiding under this, this corrugated iron. And so, you know, they allocated me, because apparently I'm, I'm brave, to... Um, to take care of this this thing, um, so we we are moving this this iron because it's right at the, right at the bottom, and um, then I, I looked just to just to make sure it was there, and it it was it was there. It was about it, it was huge. I was I was scared. Um, I was praying. Um, you know when you kind of have those those um, those times when when you need God to come through for you, you just you just become so holy, and you just pray the most holiest prayers that you can you can pray. And so I was praying, you know, Lord, uh, I hope I pray the snake will miss, you know. And and I got there, and then we're we're ready to to see the the terror that's under underneath. And so we, we decided to, to kind of barricade it. So there, on, on my side, they, they kind of made a funnel, uh, like a barricade, so at least it couldn't go from my legs. And then on the other side, there's, there's a fence. Um, so we blocked it off from, from getting out the fence because uh, we didn't want it to, to be bothering anyone else. And as, as we lifted, I don't know, God has a, a sense of humor because that snake turned into a leg of on very quickly. So I, I don't know, I don't believe in evolution, but I believe in miracles. And I think that that snake really transformed into a leg of on very quickly. Uh, so we didn't have to kill anything that day. But oh, man, telling that story has got me got me all worked up now. So um, but I mean, looking at the at how, you know, we 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 enjoy stories like that, where, you know, uh, there's exciting things that happen on the mission field, but I think um, despite all the, the fun, you know, part-time activities that, that happen on the mission field, I think we also need to remember the, the exciting stuff that's, that, that we can be involved in as, as people of God, as the children of God. So uh, just as a bit of a, a recap from, from last week, um, we looked at Genesis 12, 1 to 3, if you weren't here. Um, so... Um, just uh, going, going and looking at the, the promises that, that God made to Abr A Abram. Um, we, I, I looked at uh, a couple components that, that entailed in, that, in the promise where, uh, where uh, God was saying that Abram would become a great nation. And what does that, that in, in, entail? So if we, if we just jump back and look at uh, briefly Genesis 2, 28, where God gives the command to be fruitful and multiply. And this is, this is definitely in a physical sense and to, um, and to fill the earth with people, but there's also the, the spiritual implication there. And um, I went camping a few years ago up in Mucina, and that's another place where there's, there's lots of um, sand. Um, and there's a sandstorm the, the one night, and all of a sudden I, I just wish that, that God hadn't promised to Abram you know, so many descendants as, as the number of this, the sea sand on the, uh, on the, on the beach. Um, but uh, definitely... <laughs> Um, you know, we need to f fill the earth with God's presence in, in a very spiritual sense as well. And we need to make the, the name of the Lord known across the face of the earth, ensuring that all people would know and worship the Lord. 
And then um, looking at Genesis 11, 1 to 9, we see uh, rebelling against this, this command where people are coming together uh, in contrast to, to filling the earth. They gathered together in the same location um, and they wanted to make a great name for themselves. Again, contrasting the, the Lord making Abraham's name great, they, they wanted to make their, their own name great. And so as a result, there was um, this, this confusion of the languages and they were spread out across the face of the earth. In fact, uh, God says, I will, uh, he has a couple I will statements in this, this passage. And um, as we come to uh, Genesis 12, we, we see that there's a, a direct contrast between Babel, where they're wanting to make a, uh, where God is making a great nation for himself. Again, this is a physical nation, um, and this is a promise to, to Abram, and he would be the, the father of, of the Jews. And then at the same time as 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says, there, this is also a spiritual nation. And Abram's name would be made great and he would be a blessing to all people of all the earth. But through that nation, we see the, the lineage of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And this would be a blessing to all people fulfilled through the coming of our Lord and Savior. And this was through the lineage of Abram. And then of course, last week, we, we looked a bit, bit closer at Genesis 12, one to three. And then, where it sets up, again, the, the reality that we're looking forward to in this Christmas season of the coming Messiah and the mission that he had uh, from, uh, received from God. And then Acts 2, 1 to 13, we see almost a counter uh, babel where the people from all the nations are coming together instead of being spread out, but, um, but they were united with, without uniformity. So they were coming from all the different nations, different backgrounds, different language groups to be united together. And then we, we look to the, the future hope from Revelation 7, 9 to 10, where there's a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, language, that are standing before the throne. So we see this, this picture from, from creation. We have the creator, God, who is still the sustainer. And at, ultimately, he is the redeemer of all of creation. So God's bringing on God's blessing through faith and through obedience. So um, the passage where we'll be looking at today is Philippians 2, 1 to 11. So this, this, draws, this creates a picture of Christ's example to us and how we are to live in light of that example. So before I, I read this passage, let us just pray together. Father God, I thank you once again that we can unpack your word to, to look at your, um, how you sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for us is the, the ultimate, the culmination of, of the mission, but it still needs to be followed through to, to completion. And I thank you that you have chosen to, to partner with us, Lord, to, um, to spread your glorious name across the face of the earth. So I pray that uh, you would speak through me. I pray that I would speak your words that we would all have open hearts to receiving your message, Lord. So I pray all these things in your son's name, amen. So Philippians 2, Philippians 2, 1 to 11. I'm again reading from the, the ESV. Um, at college, I was told this was the every saint's version of the Bible. So, Philippians 2, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. 
Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be crossed, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I'm going to do things a little bit differently today. Instead of being a good Baptist, I'm going to be a rebellious Baptist and have four points. Um, and please, please don't leave. I, I, I've swapped the order of these verses just to, to demonstrate how um, we will have a bit of um, example set by Christ. And then uh, the first four verses are, uh, are leading on to how we apply this to our personal lives. So it's a bit, bit out of order, uh, but um, so please, please don't uh, stone me for, for not putting this passage or my main points in, in the right order, but I promise this will have a, have a good application point for us. So my first point is Christ's mission is God's mission. Now, because Christ Jesus is the Son of God and we believe in the Trinity, we know that Christ's mission has to correlate with the Missio Dei, God's mission. And so from verse, verses 5 and 6, we, we, we see that we're commanded to have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. So despite the, the differences we have with Christ, obviously we, uh, we're not divine beings, um, but also Christ became human. He became uh, human flesh. He was fuel, f- fully human and fully God all at the same time. So through his, um, through his work, and obviously we, the work that we, we do doesn't take away our sins or anyone else's sins, and there's also the divine nature that, that Christ has, but the attitude that uh, Paul is speaking about here is that we, we carry a self-sacrificing humility for loving uh, for love for others. Again, Christ carried the nature of God. Jesus is fully God, as we see in Romans 9, verse 5. He has the qualities that make God specifically God. He carries the same divine purpose of God. In other words, he carries the same divine mission as God. And this is a redemptive, holistic mission. Then we see that Christ has equality with God. This flows from the st- st- status and privilege of being God. This flows into the, the next point, the mission of the servant. So we see this from verses seven to eight. It starts out by saying that he emptied Himself. So don't 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 get get this passage confused or, or or wrong. It doesn't mean that he gave up his deity. John 17 verse 5 says he laid aside his glory. He humbled himself to the point of being a baby born in a manger. Imagine that. No other religion, their their gods are so transcendent or so impersonal that they, they, they wouldn't even step down into, human, into the creation if, if, they, if that's what they believe. And, and this, so this is so bizarre because our God being the, the ultimate, the, one, the only one who deserves glory is the one who stepped down into his creation and became a baby. And if you know anything about babies, if you have grandkids, if you have kids of your own, I have, uh, I have a, a baby girl, and you know, uh, the one thing about uh, babies that um, you may not know is they're kind of helpless. Um, I mean, 
Um, I was chatting to my wife yesterday and uh, we're talking about um, different kind of um, phobias and fears that, that people have. And I was saying, you know, I think there's only two fears that, um, that people are born with. I can't remember what the, what the first one was, but um, the fear of heights is definitely one that everyone is born with. And every other fear is, um, is learned. And uh, I don't think my, my daughter got the memo on, on the fear of heights because she's constantly trying to crawl off the bed. But it's something that we have to constantly be teaching her. And so imagine God of the universe, the most transcendent being, then becomes close to us. No other religion teaches this. Imagine having everything at your disposal, the, the angels of heaven at your disposal, and you become a man so that mankind can be redeemed because of the separateness due to sin. So he, was, he, he became in human likeness. He had the appearance of a man. He submitted to the humiliation of becoming a man. He took on actual characteristics of a man. He had a a physical body. He was, he was fully human, so he had to have a physical body. We don't believe, oh, you know, he was kind of like, a, like an apparition or a, a phantom or something. He just kind of looked like a, looked like a man. He had a physical body. If you, um, if you punched him, he would, have, he would have hurt, right? He, he had mental capacity. We'd see that he interacted with the, with the, the teachers of the law at a very young age. He was emotional. The, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He was spiritual. He, had a, he continued and maintained a relationship with, with his father. He was also social. He had 12 disciples. He had uh, 36 disciples. He had 72 disciples. He interacted with, with multitudes of people. He was, he was fully human. And I, I believe these, these characteristics demonstrate a, a holistic being. So Jesus is, has come with this holistic mission to meet the needs of the people. He met physical needs through the healing of the sick. He meant, uh, meant uh, mental needs, and we can see this correlation with, with social needs. If uh, someone was an outcast, he would bring them and show acceptance to them, and that would also have a lot of implications on the mental well-being of, of people, as well as the, the emotional well-being. And this trauma of being isolated as, as out, outcasts, as well as spiritual healing, forgiving. In most of the, the miracles that Jesus performed, he said, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. It's, this is a call to repentance. And he was socially countercultural, going against the, the, the social norms. So I, I just want to give you two specific examples of, of how this, this holistic mission plays out. And it's, uh, I feel like the book of Luke really brings this out. So I'm not gonna, not gonna read these passages, otherwise, um, because they're quite long and we'll be here all day. But Luke 8, 40 to 48, is, um, is, is, is two miracles, but I, I wanna just focus on the, on the first one, really. It's the, the healing of this, this, this sick woman who, who had been bleeding for 12 years. So we see from the, the, the books of the law that um, this, this bleeding would make women unclean. So firstly, uh, women were, were, uh, were inferior in, in the Jewish culture. And then on top of that, she, she has this, this bleeding, but it's persistent bleeding of 12 years. In fact, she had tried and exhausted all of her resources to, to try and be healed from this. On, a, on a, a mental scale, this, this would have had devastating effects on her. Emotionally, this would have been discomforting, and she would have had to have dealt with social rejection on top of everything. Spiritually, it doesn't, doesn't say too much about her spiritual well-being at the beginning, but imagine if you had been praying for 12 years for healing, 
and nothing had happened, what would that do to your, your spiritual well-being? Again, socially, uh, she would have been an outcast, rejected from, from everything. But as the story goes, the, Jesus is walking in a crowd going to, to Jairus' uh, house to, to heal um, Jairus' daughter. And this, this woman could have been the, the lost hope, lost strand. You know, I've heard this, this guy, Jesus, he, he performs these miracles where people are, are healed. He's given sight to the blind. He's made lame men walk. Let me, let me just try. And what happens when, when she just touches his garment? She's healed instantly. And Jesus turns around and he comforts her. He restores all those those social norms and, and puts them right. In fact, he, in, in a social sense, he calls her daughter. She's no longer unclean. She's healed physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. She had a lot of faith. And socially. The second example of how Jesus demonstrated this, and I'm, I'm sure all the Gospels have endless uh, accounts of, of Jesus uh, healing people and how he, he interacted with people holistically. Uh, but again, we would spend all day unpacking all, all of those. So the, the second one um, is from Luke 17, 11 to 19. This is Jesus healing the 10 men with leprosy. Again, leprosy was a disease that, um, that the law demanded um, social isolation. If, if you thought uh, being isolated during COVID was bad, uh, imagine being basically ostracized from your entire community because you have this, this disease. Again, mentally, they would have been outcasts, knowing they are rejected from society. Emotionally, this, again, would have caused trauma. Spiritually, you know, why, why Lord, are you separating me from, from the community? And yet, one in particular was a Samaritan, so he was outside of the, the people of God, but he was the only one who came back, to, uh, came back and thanked Jesus for healing and he praised God and he was restored fully holistically so the nature of the servants is always submissive to the will of the father and the will of the father is to see all of us as God's people all of humanity restored back to him and he did this by humbling himself to the ultimate humiliation. Never mind becoming a baby, helpless, needed to rely on his mother and his adoptive earthly father. And then he grew up. He could have come galloping on a, on a white steed and conquered the world. But he, he acted wisely in this sense. So he he ultimately humiliated, humiliated himself to the death on a cross for you and for me. And this was, I, I see this as the, the pinnacle of all of human history. Where would we be today if Jesus hadn't come and died on the cross for your sin and for my sin? And as a result, having endured the, the most humiliating, most excruciating death possible in human history. This leads to my third point, the exaltation of the servant, verses 9 to 11. Christ was exalted, um, 
we see Christ's exaltation. And he demonstrates this in Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, as well as in Acts 2, 33, which is Acts' version of the Great Commission. And then Isaiah 52, verse 13, which I'll, I'll go into in just a sec. A reflection, and this, this exaltation is a reflection on Matthew 23, 11, says, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Isaiah 52, 13 says, the servant was to act wisely and be highly exalted. Despite being disfigured and maltreated, the, the process and the, the cruelty of crucifixion was so horrendous that no one would have been able to see who Jesus was. Even his closest friends wouldn't have been able to recognize him. He was disgraced and, dis disgraced and discredited as a man, was divinely vindicated as a man to his glorious position from Ephesians 1, 21, and Hebrews 1, 45. Everyone will acknowledge Christ as Lord, whether willingly or not. Isaiah 45, 23 explains the exclusive, uh, exclusivity of the Lord God, receiving all the honor and praise, every knee bowing and every tongue confessing. And the, the, we see the language is, is repeated in relation to Jesus in our passage for this morning. John 5, 22, 23 says, the Father makes the Son the universal judge. Revelation 5, 6 to 14, the celestial beings around the throne of God fall down before the victorious Lamb at his appearance and their song is celebration of his worthiness is taken up and echoed by all creation. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb. There's no tension in the New Testament between the Lordship of Christ and the church and his Lordship over the cosmos. Romans 10, 9 says, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. When divine honors are thus paid to the humiliating and exalted Jesus, the glory of God the Father is not diminished but enhanced. When the Son is honored, the Father is glorified, for none can bestow on the Son higher honors than the Father himself has bestowed. So, what does this all mean for, for us as God's people, God's church, God's holy nation? And this brings me to my, my fourth point, the mission of God's people. So we're jumping back to, to verses one to four here. The unity of mind is not easily cultivated when human beings of um, different backgrounds and temperaments find themselves sharing one another's company, but the resources that make such unity possible are available to the people of Christ in their fellowship with him. We have all received the same spirit that binds us together in fellowship of love. The spirit dwells in the individuals as well as dwelling in the company of believers. God has poured out his love into their hearts. Romans 5, 5. So what does being united with Christ mean? Of course, again, we, we don't share the de deity of Christ. We don't have any divine nature about us. We are made in the image of God, but that doesn't mean we are divine. But being united means because God has a redemptive mission, and because Christ, being God's son, being God himself, Christ has a redemptive mission. Achieving unity calls for an attitude of humility. 
And this imitates the attitude of Christ. Being missional means we need to be humble. Internal affairs are more dangerous to the church than external threats. How many times has there been church persecution and the church has has endured? In fact, uh, one of the early church fathers said that the, the, the the growth of the church was, was stemmed from the blood of martyrs. But how many churches have fallen apart from internal affairs? But yet Christ calls us to be united together despite our differences. It doesn't matter if we're, we have a certain skin color, if we're from a certain cultural background, we're called to be united together, to have the same mind as Christ, to be humble. To, tr- to consider others more significant than ourselves, to put others' needs before our own. Attitude is the key to unity. We, sh- we as brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't have to always agree, but Jesus calls us to be united. We, share, we have a shared union. We have a shared love for Christ. We, ha- we need to have a shared love for one another. And as a result, we also need to have a shared love for the world. Being like-minded, being united with Christ involves us in that mission, in that redemptive mission. Don't get me wrong, we, we have nothing to do with saving people. We can present the best gospel presentation to people and their hearts may still be as hard as stone. It is the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit that stirs in the hearts and minds of people. We are just called to be his faithful stewards, his witnesses in a lost and dark world. Being united with Christ involves us in that mission. We're called to the same love of Christ, to lay down our lives so that others may hear the good news of the gospel message. Being one in spirit and purpose. Let's be united to others. Being of the same accord. Through humility, treat others well. And this goes back to following the example of Christ's example through the holistic mission are we meeting the deep felt needs of people and a lot of a lot of the time we think that sharing the gospel is is a spiritual affair we we must just preach the gospel and that's it but are you willing to listen to someone if you're hungry or maybe if you have emotional trauma, or if you're a social outcast, why is this person speaking to me? I'm no good. Or should we look at meeting these, these holistic needs of people? As much as we need to share the gospel, and uh, don't get me wrong, that's, that's where this all needs to lead to, but should we not be feeding the hungry, taking care of the orphan and the widow? meeting all of these needs of people. Ultimately, God is the one who heals, but he's also called us to be his ambassadors, his missionaries, his chosen people. So treat others how you would want to be treated. And finally, the way up is down. C.S. Lewis has this great quote in, in Mere Christianity, Um, I I like to read a lot of C.S. Lewis. He says, aim at earth and you'll receive nothing. Aim at heaven and you'll get both thrown in. So have a divine call. With this divine call on our lives, we should be aiming at heaven, not at worldly riches. We should be seeking after God's own heart in everything that we do. 
So next week, I'll be looking at uh, the book of Ephesians and how we are united and how we take that unity to spread the good news of the gospel. And how exciting, again, is it that we, we celebrate the birth of this, this, this child, this divine child, who humbled himself for our sake. And that's what this season is all about, is celebrating that divine child, this holy child of God, who came down as God's word to us, as our example, to lay down his life so that we can have life, eternal life through him. Let us pray together. Father God, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, and that we can remember that, that season during this, this December time. We can reflect on the divine mission that you came and made yourself a, a child to fulfill a holistic mission, Lord, to redeem a sinful humanity sinful people like myself, sinful people like everyone else here, back to yourself. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't keep this exciting message to ourselves, but that we'd be enthusiastic, we'd be excited about being able to share this good news with whoever we come into contact with, whether it's at school, at university, at our workplace, at our, at our homes, Wherever you lead us, Lord, I pray that this would be the message that we, we spread. I thank you and praise you in your son's name. Amen. In closing, may you walk each day in the footstep of Christ, embracing the humility that marked his journey. May his example of selfless love guide your actions and his compassion inspire your interactions. Amen.